initiative is the centerpiece of uh, China's international relations strategy uh, at the moment. It is mainly designed to connect the flourishing East Asia, of course China being the uh, center point of that, to the other part of the world which is basically Europe, right? And of course in the process connecting a whole lot of countries that come in between uh, to this particular connection in a sense. I think we have come to a point where relying on sea routes alone is not going to ensure that uh, you know, trade flows in a, in a seamless way. It is possible with high-speed railway and so on that you have in China, I think it is possible to have land routes that are also economical. Now, whether this is going to be the case in the short term, maybe not so, sea routes are still cheaper. But I think as we move forward, with, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, connectivity becoming cheaper over land, uh, I think connecting, say, for example, uh, Chongqing with, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, London even, uh, we know that this is already a possibility. And uh, the good part, of course, is along the way, you're going to help lift the development of uh, other countries as well. I think directly, if we look at this physical connection, this is going to kind of cut across about 20, 22 countries. Uh, but obviously, uh, some countries are going to gain more than others, right? Certain corridors that you have. Uh, and some corridors, obviously, are probably going to gain more than others, depending on what is the state of infrastructural development in some of these countries. So in the study that we have done, for example, the corridor which connects uh, China, Mongolia and Russia is supposed to be one of those corridors that probably will gain the most. And in that corridor, Mongolia is supposed to gain the most, according to our estimates. Similarly, uh, the other uh, corridor that I think is uh, quite advanced is the corridor that connects China with Indochina, pretty much Southeast Asia. And in that corridor, a country like Myanmar, for example, is supposed to benefit the most. Uh, and I think it's quite, you know, it's quite intuitive in the sense that both Mongolia and Myanmar are countries that do not have physical connectivity that much. So obviously, these are the countries that are going to uh, gain from this BRI more than others. But having said that, uh, a country like Singapore, for example, is probably uh, is also going to be um, uh, uh, benefiting from this uh, from this initiative in the sense that they are also the hub for Southeast Asia. So obviously, as a result of this connection, uh, you are going to find more goods that are going to be traveling across borders, and any country that is a hub like Singapore is also gain, going to gain from this. In this uh, project, we kind of differentiate between the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure. The hard infrastructure being the, uh, being the roads and uh, railroads and ports and also digital infrastructure. And the soft one being the trade and investment facilitation that needs to take place uh, you know, at the same time. And what is interesting, of course, is in our study, we actually find that the softer infrastructure could actually bring more benefit to countries than the physical infrastructure. There is still difficulty, there is still a lack of efficiency when it comes to land borders. So when we talk about some of the corridors that are cutting through Central Asia, West Asia and so on, where you have to cross a number of borders to get to the other side, uh, it is obvious that at these borders, these are uh, you know, probably less efficient. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, objectives of the BRI, one of the, one of the things that is also emphasised uh, is this idea of uh, developing more free trade agreements uh, you know, uh, among countries that are affected uh, you know, in this corridor. And we think, and, and our study basically shows, that these RTAs, these this, this regional trading arrangements, uh, also help to facilitate trade and investment. So, so when we talk about free trade agreements now, right, in today's environment, it's not just about removing tariffs. It's also about facilitating trade, right? Because I think more and more businesses are beginning to accept the fact that it is okay if they have to pay a certain amount of tariff. The problem that they have is the bottlenecks that they have at the customs clearance. So the example that we have uh, with the China-ASEAN free trade area. It's actually a good example to follow. 
And I would think that, uh, you know, trying to facilitate more free trade agreements with some of these other countries in Central Asia, in West Asia and so on, is probably going to help in this facilitation. And being a member of a free trade agreement like this probably would also allow China to help some of these other countries to improve their, uh, you know, their, their, their activities at the border as well. So the point here is to not just to think about the physical part of it, but also there has to be an emphasis on the trade facilitation part of it as well. Only then we're going to have this seamless connection.